Hello, this is Dr. Melissa Stiles with the University of Wisconsin Department of Family Medicine, and today's FAM MedCast is an introduction to nutraceuticals. I'm pleased to be joined by Dr. Dave Rakel, who's here to discuss the topic. Thanks for joining me, Dave. Thanks for having me, Melissa. First off, how do you define nutraceuticals? It's a term people may not be familiar with. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a generic term that just is used to lump into one category botanicals, supplements, things that include not only vitamins but also plants, maybe homeopathic remedies. But the term nutrition, pseudicals, implies that we're using nutrition in a way that hopefully will enhance or give the body what it needs to heal itself. Well, there's been such an explosion in this in the past, especially decade. What's led up to this explosion, and why are people seeking nutraceuticals? I think there's a lot of different reasons for that, but the big boom was in the 1990s, where the market for many botanicals and supplements grew quite rapidly. I think now with the uh, the greater investment in research, we're starting to understand which ones are potentially beneficial and which ones are potentially harmful. For example, a recent meta-analysis published in the journal JAMA found that certain vitamins in high quantities, like vitamin E, vitamin A, beta carotene, can actually increase mortality and morbidity. So I think the take-home message there is just like in pharmaceuticals, we pull out one active ingredient and give it a very high concentrations. The potential risks or potential harms are much greater than if we eat the whole plant. So there's a, quite a wide spectrum there between uh, an isolated chemical that we give in high concentrations, which can include pharmaceuticals or nutraceuticals, such as SAMe, which we might talk about here a little bit. You know, that's an isolated chemical that has benefit, but also may have uh, more potential side effects versus eating broccoli. You know, the, uh, that also has many beneficial influences, but that too honors the synergy of the whole plant. You know, our traditional medical system removes one what we think is the active ingredient and give it at high doses, whereas nature puts a lot of different chemicals together in a plant that may have synergy that may actually trump the beneficial effects of the isolated chemical in isolation. So it's, it's, it's fun to look at that whole spectrum of effects and, and see uh, the difference between an isolated chemical and a whole plant uh, in regards to how that influences health and wellness. Now, going back to the one ingredient, when I go in and I look at bottles and labels, I have and there's a list of ingredients. I don't know where to start. How do you look at the label? How do you know what's quality, what's not? That's a tough one because you recommend a product. The patient goes to the, to the store and there's about 18 different forms of that product on the shelf. <laughs> We're going to get a little bit better. There's going to be two stamps of approval, if you will. One's called the GMP, Good Manufacturing Practices, which ensures that the product has what it says in it, in it, and also is free of contaminants. And in order to get the GMP stamp of approval, the nutraceutical company also has to be inspected and make sure that they have good quality manufacturing standards. The next one is going to be a stamp from the U.S. Pharmacopeia saying that it's USP verified. And this will also uh, include the GMP standards, but we'll also make sure that there's no uh, potential harmful contaminants, as well as make sure that the nutraceutical product is able to be broken down and absorbed adequately through the GI tract. Uh, so that's going to take it one step further to really ensure that these products give us confidence as practitioners to feel more confident recommending them. Unfortunately, since these products are not FDA approved, the FDA has no oversight on the quality of these products. But with these new standards, uh, we can feel more confident in prescribing them. That's great to know. Let's turn to a couple of specific conditions, dyslipidemia, osteoarthritis, and migraine headaches. Many supplements propose to alter or improve our lipid profile from red yeast to grapeseed extract. Can you summarize a a few of the findings that have been found so far? Yeah, this is a good example of of why we need research in this area. For example, there's one product called polycosinol uh, that comes from sugar cane that was thought to look quite promising in lowering uh, LDL and total cholesterol. Unfortunately, all the research came from one lab in Cuba 
And um, more recently, there was a much better study done outside of that lab that really showed that that product does not result in a significant benefit in lowering cholesterol. So I used to prescribe polycosinol, but now I, I don't. But uh, if you look at the Leon Heart diet study, we see that there are certain food products that are very beneficial in lowering cholesterol. Often found in the Mediterranean diet, those include soy protein, viscous fiber, plant sterols and stainols, and nuts. And, you know, we always start with the food first to say, okay, let's, let's incorporate these in your diet. So there's a study called the Portfolio Diet that incorporated these four food groups, viscous fiber, uh, in the form of psyllium or guar gum or ground flaxseed, uh, soy protein, nuts. It was it, the study was sponsored by the California Almond Growers Association, oh, okay. <laughs> so so it was a handful of almonds, uh, but it could really be any nuts. Walnuts are also very rich in omega three fatty acids, and uh, so the nuts uh, appear to uh, lower cholesterol. And then plant sterols and stainols. In this study, they used plant uh, sterol and stainol rich spreads such as Take Control or Benacol. Uh, which are margarines rich in these plant sterols. The problem is, in order to get enough of those plant sterols, you need to ingest about two tablespoons of this spread a day. And if you're putting that on bread or something else, uh, sometimes, even though you might, your cholesterol may be going down, you're going to gain some weight uh, when you're using that much. So one supplement that may prove beneficial is isolated beta cytosterol, which are these plant sterols and stainols. So what that is, it's a cholesterol that the plant can make, but we can't. And when we ingest the plant, and that's why a vegetable-rich diet is so healthy, when we ingest the plant, it inhibits the absorption of cholesterol. So think of uh, beta cytosterol as the zedia of supplements. It works the exact, well, maybe not the exact same way, but the same mechanism of action to inhibit the absorption. So uh, sometimes I'll prescribe 300 to 600 milligrams before each meal of isolated beta cytosterol and if it's a if it's a, a man with benign prostatic hypertrophy with elevated cholesterol it also seems to be beneficial for BPH as well a two for one a two for one all right yes. great to know in terms of osteoarthritis we have glucosamine chondroitin one of the mm-hmm. big nutraceuticals of our age here can you summarize the latest on that and also SAMI for us or yeah those? So we've learned recently a lot more about glucosamine because of the GATE trial. A GATE trial was a a well-done large uh, study that showed that glucosamine, as well as glucosamine and chondroitin, uh, really did not have as as big a benefit as we once thought. That is contradictory to previous studies, which are also very done showing that that it does. Now, things to remember about glucosamine is it is thought to increase the fluid uh, content within the meniscus. Chondroitin is thought to increase the viscosity of the synovial fluid. So one increases the fluid of of the bumper, the other one increases the the synovial viscosity of the fluid. Glucosamine is made from shellfish, crustacea. So if you have a patient with shellfish allergy, you really need to warn them that they could have an allergic reaction. Chondroitin is made from pig trachea. So if you have a vegetarian, they may not want to take Factoid that. Factoid of the day there. Right. Okay. Uh, chondroitin, there's also a question, since it's such a big molecule, how well we can absorb it? The potential harm seems to be quite little. Both of these, particularly the glucosamine in previous studies prior to the GATE study, found it not to work as well in, in obese people. So it seems to work better in more lean people. And that seems pretty straightforward because of all the weight on the joints. Now, what the GATE trial showed is with, with Glucosamine hydrochloride, well, that's the form they used, it didn't seem to work. But the critics of the study would say, well, most of what we prescribe here in the United States is glucosamine sulfate, uh, which may work in a different mechanism. Uh, and many of the previous studies that showed benefit used glucosamine sulfate and not glucosamine hydrochloride. So uh, if you are going to use glucosamine, I strongly encourage people to use a glucosamine sulfate. Tell people it's not going to work if they're overweight and and encourage another motivation for weight loss. But what we're finding with uh, glucosamine is it may be more of a disease-modifying agent versus a symptom-suppressing agent. You know, I give Tylenol, I give ibuprofen, that's a symptom-suppressing agent. It's not really doing anything to inhibit the progression of the disease. Whereas other things, such as possibly glucosamine and avocado, actually seems to be a food that also may be somewhat disease-modifying. So again, I always encourage people to enjoy 
a little guacamole. <laughs> but uh, that and omega-3 fatty acids may help reduce some of the inflammation associated with osteoarthritis. Now, you mentioned SAMe, which is something that's been used over in Europe for quite some time. Uh, SAMe works for three things well, and it's kind of interesting why, why these three things. It works for osteoarthritis, it works for depression, and it also works for liver disease. Three very different diagnoses. But when you look at the mechanism of action, which no one really understands for sure, it seems to work, at least in part, through enhancing cell membrane communication. And that's why in depression it's thought to potentially help the serotonin and norepinephrine pass through the synaptic space more efficiently. You have to be careful, though, when you use it in depression because it can be overstimulating and it can lead to insomnia. So you never want to give it before bedtime. One of my favorite side effects of SAMe is euphoria. <laughs> I tell patients that, I'll take some of that. But it can be overstimulating, so you have to be careful with that. And some people just can't tolerate it, it makes them too anxious. And you definitely don't want to use CME if you have someone who's at risk of mania, because it may exacerbate their mania. The studies on arthritis seem to uh, work just as well as NSAIDs without the potential side effects. And the, the least amount of research probably is on liver disease. The challenge with SAMe is it's very, very expensive and insurance companies don't cover it and you know if someone's going to take therapeutic doses which is 600 milligrams twice a day on average of SAMe we're looking at 40 to 50 bucks out of pocket per month mm -hmm. uh, so you you know you offer someone SAMe versus a SSRI that's covered by their insurance they're probably going to pick the SSRI also another thing to remember about SAMe is is it oxidizes in bottles so if you buy it, it should be in blister packs. Uh, otherwise, it, it's likely to age quickly and may not be as effective as it, versus those uh, pills that are individually wrapped in the blister packs. Okay. Well, let's turn to um, migraine headaches. And if you okay. could just summarize some of the common nutraceuticals that are used for migraine headaches. Yeah. Well, the main thing with migraines is prevention. And usually what seems to have the most evidence first is vitamin B2, which isn't a it isn't great. There's been two well-done studies showing that high doses of vitamin B2, which is riboflavin, uh, reduces the frequency of migraines. But you have to give 400 milligrams, and vitamin B2 generally comes in 50 milligrams or 100 milligrams, so you have to make sure they're taking 400 milligrams a day. That, along with magnesium, which seems to help stabilize the vascularity, vascular shifts of of contraction and relaxation. It seems to step, stabilize the vascularity associated with headaches. Magnesium and vitamin B2 seem to work well together. I usually recommend magnesium glycinate or magnesium malate, which causes less of a diarrhea effect, 500 to 750 milligrams at night. And then the third one that's often used is feverfew. Feverfew inhibits leukotrienes and prostaglandins, and that's why it was used way back when for fever, because it, it suppressed the fever. It most recent research found it not to work quite as well and doesn't seem to be as promising as vitamin B2 and magnesium. Uh, but there is a formulation I often recommend called MigRelief uh, that has vitamin B2, magnesium, and feverfew in it. The nice thing about that is that it has 200 milligrams per pill of vitamin B2 and they only have to take two pills a day for the prophylactic effect. The last promising botanical for migraine relief is butterbur also known as pedicytes. Uh, this got its name because before there was refrigeration, we used to wrap our butter in its large leaves uh, to keep the butter fresh. Butter burr also inhibits leukotrienes and may have a beneficial influence on the inflammatory processes associated with migraine headaches. And it also works for allergies. Uh, one well-done study found it to work as well as Zyrtec, non-sedating antihistamine, for uh, allergies. But you have to take it three times a day versus once a day with the Zyrtec. But if someone wants to avoid pharmaceuticals and they want to try a, a plant-based product for their allergies or to prevent migraine headaches, uh, butter burr or pedicides seems to be very uh, promising. In, in summary, what are your take-home points for patients that are navigating nutraceuticals? I think the take-home point, and I think this is true for pharmaceuticals, is if we can just get these nutrients through whole foods, through uh, what nature knows a lot more about this than we do. And nature seems to put a lot of good ingredients together in the plant or the vegetable or the, or the fruit. 
And if we can and use our food as our as our medicine and eat our seven to nine servings of fruits and vegetables a day and eat a lot of different colors, we'll get all of these good ingredients. So maybe we don't need to use as many rescue therapies for depression or migraines or cholesterol if we would just start by uh, eating what nature gave us on the trees instead of in the, in the pillbox. Well, thank you very much, Dave. Thank you, Melissa.